back then in the days when we had Elvis, um, that was a lot of people, traditionalists, that said, oh, that's bad for our youth. That's really bad. I can hear my, or I can see my grandma dancing to Elvis today. So there's a complete acceptance of what was from some people abandoned back then in acceptance. So they refused to accept Elvis. But today it's like a common sense, I would say. It went into a uh, society's mainstream. Changing Lanes, the official podcast of BMW. Welcome to this episode of Changing Lanes, the official podcast of BMW. My name is Jonathan, and today on the podcast, we have a very special guest with us. Born in Darmstadt, he worked as a freelance graphic designer for record labels and design agencies before beginning university studying transportation design. In 2003, after graduating, he joined the BMW Group as an exterior designer. And from 2009, he was part of the team assembled to create the BMW i products and brand. From 2013 to 2016, he headed up the BMW Group's advanced design studio and went to oversee design projects for mid-size BMW models. He is one of the early pioneers of BMW i design and the possessor of a progressive outlook and open mind. Please welcome to the show the head designer at BMW i, Kai Lange. Hey, Hello. Kai, how you doing? Hello, Jonathan. <laughs> nice to be here. Thank you. <laughs> Great to have you on the show. So those were just some of the accolades that you've received, but I'm sure that our podcast listeners, they want to hear a little bit more about yourself. So feel free to introduce yourself. Okay. As you just said, I'm Darmstadt born. I'm a native German. I'm 44 years old, which is still young, <laughs> definitely. Uh, and I feel even younger. I'm a dad of two kids. I'm married. Um, I'm a family man. Um, we consider life kind of being average and boring, but actually I don't feel like this. Mm -hmm. um, I'm interested in design since ever. Uh, I'm interested in, in creating things since ever. Started out with like drawing comics when I was a little kid. Oh, wow. Yeah. You know? And um, then, yeah, um, as you just said, I've been in the agencies. I did some record covers uh, most of the time. And um, then I got interested in car design. And uh, yeah, that's actually uh, the best job in the world that I have today. <laughs> wow. From comics to car design, that's a pretty impressive jump right there. So, Kai, the general public only sees the final product of what you designed for BMW i. But I want to take a little inside peek at what a typical day in the life is for you so we can help our podcast listeners understand more about your job, your responsibilities, and your creative process because you're such a creative person. So what is a typical day in the life for Kai Langa? I would start with a typical cool days because they are also not so cool days <laughs> and sometimes uh, days could become also boring because you have to to deal with some management stuff which is a little bit more dry um but what i do every time and every day in the morning is like i'm making around and uh, see if i can meet as much people from my team as i can because mm -hmm. they obviously also um being occupied and have to work and stuff like that but i like to say hello and um, that's seriously important to me to have a contact every day that they uh, um, that we are here that we can talk to each other and mm -hmm. um, yeah that we uh, um, interact with each other and then yeah then I've got a program I have to do things um, I'm uh, um, I'm monitored as well as everybody <laughs> in a in a big company um, but uh, what we do other day we're talking about design uh, we're going through the projects that are happening right now we have reviews we're talking about mm -hmm. the sketches all in different phases all in at the different uh, level in the in the current process some more advanced so they are already like close to production other stuff like writing in the beginning where we go way more creative mm -hmm. and this is what i like on on my day on our day in uh, in uh, in design is that we have like uh, a variety of of levels we can we we go in a day from super creative mm -hmm. and and uh, really inventing the world in 20 years to okay we have to deliver tomorrow yeah. like this specific piece yeah down to the point um yeah that's very interesting wow very interesting wow and I absolutely love that you take the time in the beginning of the day just to chat with your team, just to say hi to everybody, get everybody on the same wavelength, 
because you're sort of like the person in between, you know, you have to make sure that your design team is on the same page, but also in the meetings and different design processes and different positions that you're in, in the beginning, middle and end, you've got to be that go-between person and make sure that everything's running smoothly with the company, but also with your design team as well. So I really like that you check in with your team. That's awesome. Yeah, yes, of course. That's very important because we are a very diverse team. Mm. I mean, you have different characters. That's actually what I like. Mm -hmm. uh, I like very different characters and um, they all have to come together. Yeah, of course. And communication is the key. Yeah, most definitely. So, all right, Kai, I'm going to be a little bit adventurous and bold. You gave us the inside peek of what a typical day is like for you. So Kai, what have you been up to? What is a typical day in the life for Kai Lange when working on the IX? How has that been a change from your normal design process? Um, that's kind of like a hard question because our normal design process at BMW AI is to find out things like the IX. Mm. So I couldn't say that the IX is exceptional mm -hmm. because um, it's so cool that we have been paid for being progressive and always <laughs> find the new things. I would say like the normal in our case is being ahead and always thinking uh, beyond what others might think. Mm -hmm. um, but in particular, the IX had like a, a tough task to uh, to include the new uh, uh, things that we have to come up with mm -hmm. for, for our customers. And uh, the briefing was quite hard. Yeah. So nothing usual. So we had to go into, into deep investigation, <laughs> as always. Exactly, exactly. Uh, all right, Kai, so you mentioned that the briefing was a little bit different. It was hard. So what can you tell us without giving too much away of how you had to be a little bit more progressive, more open-minded, more future thinking to build this amazing model? Hmm, that's, that's a tough one. Let me think of it. <laughs> that's a tough one without getting too deep into yeah. it. Um, so uh, it wasn't that hard to include all the technical requirements that we had that uh, we have to cover for the future. It was more hard to uh, reinterpret what people already thought about uh, SAVs coming from, from uh, BMW. Mm -hmm. And just to jump in really quickly for the podcast listeners that don't know what SAV is, that is Sports Activity Vehicle. All right, back to you, Kai. And... Um, there are certain expectations from from people because we build up reputation on on SAVs uh, at BMW, and um, there are expectations which could be really really hard, mm. you know, and really to the point. Yeah, and to um, get and that transition into the new um, uh, things that we had to incorporate into the product, that was the hard thing, you yeah. know, and also give you a, a pretty good example i mean it is tough to think about a car which is from its origin already big into a very very aerodynamically efficient form you know so you have to walk different path mm -hmm. you know yeah i think and i know that we're going to speak about this later in the podcast of of how cust how you design for customers and for the future but sometimes the customer's like, wait a minute, what? I'm not sure about this. We're going to get into this. But I, like I, like I mentioned before, how I like how you meet with your design team in the beginning and making sure that everything's cool and that you're sort of like the middle, the person in between, the middleman between your team and the and BMWi, and just making sure that everything's running smoothly. It's sort of like you have to be not only a future seer, but also an amazing communicator to make sure that the direction that things are going in the future is also going to be ticking all the boxes for everybody involved. And maybe if they're not understanding what it is yet, that they have an inkling, they have an idea of which direction it's going in. So we're I'm just so excited to dive into this. <laughs> I'm changing the topic already, but I wanted to let the podcast listeners know we're going to dive into this amazing position that Kai's in and how he helps not only BMW i, but also the BMW fans and customers. So back to my question. As you know, our podcast is called Changing Lanes, and the word change holds meaning for you. You've even said that the I in BMW I stands for innovation, but for you, it also stands for inspiration, which I kind of like. And now there's currently a BMW campaign out there called What's Your Reason Not to Change, featuring the IX. 
Now, a campaign that's all about starting a conversation with people about their reasons not to change, whether it be to future mobility tech like electric engines, sustainability, connectivity, performance, or even design. So what do you think of those reasons not to change? And what do you tell people who are afraid to change? That's the point. I mean, we have to we have to go into a definition of change itself mm. because you can define it in a positive way or you can define it in a negative way. I think a lot of people who are afraid define change in a negative way. Hmm? Sounds kind of logic, right? Mm -hmm. um, and um, the reason, then we have to find out what's the reason for that. Mm -hmm. Why do they see change as a negative thing for them and then we have to turn it into a positive thing yeah. and then we can make them friends with a change and then they could feel comfortable with it so that's also the point because a change sometimes could become a challenge for some people mm -hmm. and a challenge not always is comfortable for everybody so there are people who actually don't want to get challenged in their private life mm -hmm. or in that specific uh, part of their life and um so this, we, we have to listen to these people. We have to understand the people because at the end, they are fans, right? Mm -hmm. And um, it's very, very important to understand them, to listen to the people and actually where their pain points are. Mm. Because we need to know we are doing our products for these people. Yeah. We are doing our products for the fans. And if we wouldn't listen to them, we can't react to that. But on the other side, also, we believe that we have to progress, mm -hmm. that we have to... Uh, um, tackle all the future challenges that could come up. We also oversee like a time where a current customer doesn't even have an idea that he would need it in 10 years time. Um, but if he then needs it, we already have the product for that, mm -hmm. you know, and in a very comfortable way. So I would say we provide a very comfortable change so that the change is not being seen as a challenge, more as a comfortable way of getting into something new. Mm. Sort of like reading their minds before they even know that they need it. And when they do need it, it's already there in a comfortable way. Exactly. That's that's our task. Yeah. Our Love, job. That. <laughs> Love that. Love that. Also, that's coming something that's coming up for me. I've always noticed whenever, you know, if if I'm a fan of a of a music band, right? Going back to designing music band covers, right, for you. Um, I know that when my favorite brand comes out with a new album, I'm so excited. And then maybe they took a different direction, a different musical direction. And then, you know, the first time that you listen to it, either you love it or then you go, oh, no, this just isn't, this isn't the old band. But then it grows on you and your mentality to that band changes over time. And you're like, you know what? I'm seeing the progression of this band. Um, and it's reminding me the same thing, but in a much bigger scale with BMW i and the iX that, you have to think progressively. You have to think future-proof. And like we said before, creating something for the fan and for the customer that they might not know yet that they need, but when it is there, it's there and it's comfortable. And I think that's a big leap of faith in not only creativity, but innovation. I think creativity is great. We can all be creative. We can create a meal. We can try a new spice. But to be innovative is the next level. And that's what you do at BMWI. So, um, as I mentioned in your intro, you've changed through the years, graduating from university and starting with the BMW Group as an exterior designer, and now you're the head of design at BMW i. And you've definitely experienced many changes through your career. So, how do you deal with change, and how do you adapt to it? Mm. I like I like to change. Mm -hmm. uh, that's something that gives me a feel of feeling of progression so i develop myself mm -hmm. also i like to learn every day something something new actually um when you do you feel i feel happy with it i mm. I, I have fun to learn things to see new things and um i also believe if i wouldn't change um i wouldn't be able to do that right so um i really like to cha change but I don't plan it. Mm -hmm. I don't plan, okay, tomorrow I have to change. No, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm not doing it. It's more like um, I adapt to things that, that come up that people ask me for. Mm -hmm. um, can you guys do this? And have you thought about that? And if it's something new, they say, yeah, okay, we do. We take care about it. Even mm -hmm. though at that point, I don't know anything about it, but I really like, and then the change just happens. Yeah. Because 
you want to tackle that problem, that challenge, you want to go into this one, get no idea how to do that. So you simply start with it, you jump in the cold water, and then you have to change, you yeah. have to progress, you have to do something in order to, to fulfill the expectations that you come up with an answer. Most definitely. Yeah. So I really like that because every time we do, I do with the whole team, the whole team does it, we feel actually really comfortable with not knowing what to do. Mm -hmm. um, in the beginning, that that's important. We yeah. we uh, we know what to do when uh, uh, when we progress. But in the beginning, um, everybody in our team, BMWI, we like the challenge of okay, let's go. Yeah. We see, and um, that's also that we that I have to provide. I have to provide like a um, a very stable basis where people can jump off from and start the rocket and search for new things. Yeah. But it needs like a very stable basis. Yeah. And um, then we find out things, then we come back and we transfer it to uh, the other, mo other models, for example. Uh, that's where we feel comfortable with, you know, not having a sofa, but taking it out and see where we sit tomorrow. That's so cool. And I know that a lot of people are resistant to change. They don't want to try something new. They're so quote unquote, comfortable from where they are. But really, I love your perspective of it. People come to you with this idea, let's do this. Great. Okay, let's try it out. We have no clue how we're going to do it, but we're going to bring our heads together and use the team and the trust that we have to try things out and see what happens. I think that's something remarkable that we don't hear a lot about every day. And it's great hearing it from you. So going from there, what was the biggest change you've experienced in your career so far? The biggest change was probably when I became responsible not only for the product and uh, budget, uh, also for the people. Mm. Uh, and um, because as soon as you get like being responsible for, um, I just said that, how people could work, how they could do their job, and also for the strategy, what they're working for, everything. Mm. That's a whole new level on, uh, on responsibility that you get all of a sudden. And I liked it. I, I uh, didn't think twice when they offered me this job. And I was like, yes, okay, cool. Um, and then you get all these uh, things that, that show up you haven't experienced before. So that was probably the biggest change mm. because it's like a different responsibility. All yeah. of a sudden you're responsible for people and that they feel good. And you have also uh, you also know that it affects their private life and stuff mm -hmm. like that so that was probably the biggest the biggest ch change yeah that's amazing you know going from oh i'm a designer behind my computer doing my things to i'm not just a designer i'm also leading a group of people it's it's another role and another responsibility completely yeah. and finding that balance is a big change most definitely all right, changing gears slightly, we've asked our social media followers what they want to know from you as a BMW designer, and we've sectioned them into two rapid fire segments. So this is the first rapid fire segment. Are you ready, Kai? I, I am ready, yeah. <laughs> okay, so rapid fire question round number one, a total of six questions, and you must answer these questions as quickly as you can. The least amount of words as possible, maybe one or two sentences max. Okay, rapid fire question number one is, when you were first starting out, who was your designer idol or your role model? That was back in school, Issey Miyake. Because I really, really like the way how he is like dealing the 2D cloth thing yeah. into a three-dimensional um, sculpture mm -hmm. with the, the way he did the plissé thingies. I was seriously impressed. Seriously impressed. Yeah. Dude. Awesome. Second rapid fire question is, if you had no limitations and could design the car of your dreams, what would it look like? My today's dream is that it would look like my living room because actually I would drive on its own. I don't have to do anything, sit in my living room, just do what I want to do. That would be my dream. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Rapid fire question number three. When you're designing cars, are cup holders a priority? I would say it depends on the customer's priority for mm -hmm. the purpose of the car. Good answer. Very diplomatic. Rapid fire question number four. Any advice on how to get started with designing cars? Think for who it is. Mm. Rapid fire question number five. With technology changing so rapidly and smartphones being connected to us all the times, how did smart connection in cars change the way of design and how did it change your job? Mm, 
that was a progression as well, and we had to get used to it. Um, and we did very well, I have to say. We have to think about use possibilities instead of fixed use cases in the past. So, yeah, people more free, they can do different things, more use possibilities, mm -hmm. and we have to cover them all. Yeah, awesome. And sixth question, where do you get your ideas from? I would divide it into two things. Ideas I get from watching people, how they act, how they interact with things. And um, then I question myself in a very naive way, why it's that way? Has it ever been like that? Mm -hmm. Does it have to be like that? Sometimes it's a yes, and then, oh, okay, we don't change. Yeah. Sometimes it's like, we can do it differently. This is where I get my ideas from. My inspiration, I would say, I get from all kinds of art mm -hmm. and what people do and movies and even computer games. Amazing, amazing. Okay, rapid fire question round number one is over. Thank you so much, Kai. That was a lot of fun. <laughs> so let's get back to our topic of change within the design department. So the work that you do, it, dude, it's totally progressive. You're literally sketching the future and bringing creative solutions to innovative technology and giving them a home in the BMW i series. But with anything new, there's going to be resistance. And like I spoke about before, that resistance coming back from the customers and the fans or the traditionalists who say that they want to keep things the same, that can be seen as a reason not to change. A very heated topic on social media, to say the least. You know, comments like, why does the steering wheel look so odd? Or why is the grill vertical? Or why are electric cars so ugly? And the front looks like an angry woodchuck or even like donkey teeth. Sheesh. So why the big change in design, Kai? Hmm. First of all, I really respect these people who um, refuse to change for now. Um, I listen to them. We have to because they have a reason for that. They have a reason why they refuse to change now. Um, on one hand, I have to say they pretend to refuse because there's a natural progression anyway. Let me give you this example. Back then in the days when we had Elvis, um, that was a lot of people, traditionalists, that said, oh, that's bad for our youth. That's really bad. I can hear my, or well, can see my grandma dancing to Elvis today. So there's a complete acceptance of what was from some people abandoned back then in acceptance. So they refused to accept Elvis. But today it's like a common sense, I would say. It went into a society's mainstream. Another example is like back in the days you might remember, it's like Sex Pistols. When they showed up, that was hell on earth. I mean, they said like, oh, everything is going down. I buy today punk shirts uh, at H&M for my kids. You know, and there's an acceptance on these things. So you can see it's like everybody who obviously went too far back then brought society to grow. And even those who refused at that point learned to accept, I would say by accident, maybe they haven't felt it, but a couple of years later, they accept things they never thought they would back then in the days. So even when people pretend to refuse today, I bet they will accept something in 10 years time. That's a natural progression. And, but we still listen to them. Why do they refuse? And um, because they have a strong emotion about it and we don't want to lose them. So we also say we still have to give people who would refuse the big step now something that, uh, that does just that much of a step that they would expect. And this we do in general at the, at the, in, in, in the BMW group. There's mm -hmm. something for everything. We don't change everything all over new and uh, take people so far out <laughs> without them knowing. You exactly. Know? So um, we maybe ask them to renew that one, right? So this is what we do. And um, because we also see with the progression and what we see, there are new possibilities for them. They don't know yet. And while refusing that, they're not open for the new technologies or the new possibilities. So we try to give them the comfortable way, but they don't have to. Mm -hmm. You give them options. We, we give options. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, within the BMW group, we anyway do. There's mm, something for everybody. Exactly. I, you know, 
especially going back to those comments, those negative comments, it's so easy to comment anonymously on something on your smartphone. That's easy. And and be like, yeah, this is stupid or or any silly comment that maybe isn't as productive as it could be to help you and the whole BMW i team. But I absolutely respect you for saying, you know, their comments are valid. We have to listen to them. We have to say, okay, I get it. Yes, and we're building a future for you with your, if, if it's we're going to replace the entire sofa or just, you know, do a little up to, upgrade to it. I, I really respect your diplomacy and and listening to the people that are maybe stuck, not wanting to change, but also saying, hey, look at this perspective that I can see, maybe you can't see it yet, but there are other options out there. And I would, to, I would like to add something yeah. to that. Um, there's emotions, there are emotions involved. When I comment something that I don't like, I have a strong emotion about mm -hmm. it. And this is what I really like. Not that people don't like it. I would definitely prefer that they like it. Yeah. But also um, there are emotions. I like the emotional thing. If we would do things which won't provoke any sort of emotion, we haven't done our job right. Mm -hmm. Would I feel sad about my job to do something so neutral that people don't even want to talk about it? Mm. Um, we believe that we have to live with our emotions. Emotions could be something positive. It makes us human. That's We are not machines, even though when we have all these possibilities, digitalization, uh, computers, everything, we are still humans. We still have to deal with, uh, uh, with emotions. And even these negative comments, these are emotions. And I like that we have people who get emotional about us and then we work with it and we bring these negative ones into positive ones. Because mm -hmm. that's really where the change happens, isn't it? When they have that negative emotion, you can listen to their feedback and say, so how can yeah. we help you? How can we frame this to make it work for you? And sometimes they're going to say something, I want this. And it's like, well, actually, this is included. Yeah. This is here. We've maybe already we done it for you. <laughs> maybe we haven't told you enough. Exactly. <laughs> you know, just listen, stay with us. I love that you're emotionally engaged, but just stay with us. There's something on the horizon for you. There's a surprise. That's awesome. I love that. That's amazing. All right. I'm going to pry even deeper, Kai, okay? Okay. <laughs> so there's been resistance on many other aspects to what you design. More comments like there are no emotions in electric cars, like we were speaking just now about emotions. Why does the steering wheel look odd? Like I said before, it took BMW way too long to come up with a new electric car and all electric cars are ugly. So we spoke about it before, but how do you deal with these comments? And can you give our listeners maybe the reasonings, maybe a little perspective into the future behind these design changes, which in turn will be a betterment for the BMW customer and the fan base on a whole. With new technologies also come new possibilities in a design way. I mean, if we don't have a engine in the front anymore, we can do different things with the, with the car. We've seen many of them. Everybody's dealing differently with that. Uh, also, there is no common way of dealing with it. I mean, if you look on car history, the past 80 years, the cars became so similar mm -hmm. because the technology went the same for everybody yeah. and uh, every invention also became part of uh, um, somebody else. And they all actually offer the same. So the cars, they, they look the same. They have a bonnet, they have four wheels. Obviously, in the future, they will still have four wheels, kind of, for a while. <laughs> but... Um, they become really, really similar. And we haven't had um, a remarkable change in technology that is also um, driving the design into a different or other direction. With the, with the challenge of the electromobility and the way we can architect the car, uh, we have new ways. We have the possibility of dealing with the design differently. Mm -hmm. And this is a, we see it as a benefit. And we want to give it also to the customers because then you all of a sudden get with like, for example, a smaller car size, a smaller fit footprint, more interior space. Mm -hmm. So therefore the exterior in its appearance has to change. You know, it becomes a bit less uh, bonnet in the front, all these things, but there's a benefit for it. And at first glance, it looks kind of weird for some people because they have for 50 years been used some, uh, to see something different. Oh, yeah. This is new, but they have to also adopt or slowly get into the benefit for it. 
you know. Mm -hmm. As I just said, for some people, change doesn't feel that comfortable and it has to come with time. Mm -hmm. Others go really quick, accept it and say like, yes, it's, I'm waiting for this since mm -hmm. ages, <laughs> you know. But people are different. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah, Kai, you know, you spoke about having a smaller footprint and, you know, working with BMW i, getting in there, creating the i3, that was a huge popular hit in the beginning, but it really does stand for sustainability and a smaller footprint. And then now the time after it, it's becoming more accepted. So tell us a little bit more about going into BMW i, starting something completely new and changing the landscape of how innovation is done. First of all, I have to say there was no BMW i back then. Uh -huh. There was just the idea that we have to react to um, a progression in cities, um, a context that will happen, we assumed will happen, um, of, for example, like having more and more cars in the city, less space, um, to name one thing. And uh, we thought, or the company back then, uh, strongly thought about we need to react on this. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to uh, get an answer for this uh, question that will come up, obviously will come up. And on top, okay, we still have like the pollution thing going on. It needs to be economically friendly. It needs to be uh, really, really sustainable. And um, so we had some some technical requirements on that side. So it very quickly was the point, it needs to be electromobility, mm -hmm. a battery driven car, a BAF. And, um, but coming from the question of being like the smaller footprint, more efficient interior space, uh, we used that technology to make an architecture that gave us that possibility to do so. Mm -hmm. So first of all, we had a flat floor because all of a sudden we had like the battery in the floor, we had some sort of like sandwich. We don't need a tunnel anymore. So you could have like a flat floor and then you see, oh, if we have a flat floor, you can park the car on a crowded street and then move out the car, exit the car on the other side uh -huh. because we made it walk through. So these are examples where the technology leads into new possibilities and actually cr clever ideas that we then uh, uh, could could uh, develop and show in the car. So did the overall architecture. When you look on the, the whole interior front dashboard uh, architecture, how we build it, how we designed it there, it's all kind of uh, free and um, airy um, in order to, to communicate that more space that you actually mm -hmm. that you actually have. Um, so we de developed this this product, and there was no brand back then because <laughs> uh, the the need to come up with a sub brand was quickly shown. Then, when we presented the product, when the product became more and more in shape, what it would be. It wasn't finished back in the days, but it was sure that it will be seriously progressive. And we talked about our fan base. We talked about acceptance, um, and. Uh, for sure, there could have been the risk that if we would have done it with a pure BMW that people say like, oh, these guys are going crazy. So we discussed the fact building up a, a, a sub brand uh, who could transport and communicate all these new things, all the pioneering that we, um, that we do with these products. And then we went parallel to the car into a development of a sub brand. What should it be? What's the meaning behind it? What is the the, the mission? And um, this is where we develop BMW i and not only the sub brand on paper, also the mindset for everybody working with it, because this mindset got established of like free thinkers of people who tackle an idea without knowing how to do it technically, but with the trust in themselves, we will find a way. You know, and that's the mindset is still still uh, available, still living in today's BMW i. And um, this is why um, I think and I believe that's our strong point that we can pioneer whatever comes. So we don't fear. My team doesn't fear. They feel so comfortable. And yeah, give us a new challenge. Give us a new idea, something that will show up. We will make it. What I really love about what you just said is that, you know, the beginning of BMWi, there was no sub-brand. You, oh. you were just, 
answering questions, being challenged and trusting in, okay, we're going to fix this. And when we, like you said, with the, with the flat floor, okay, now we have the flat floor, but oh, now we can do this. And the, once you finish answering a question and once you finish figuring out what that one challenge is, it offers up a whole new row of different possibilities that you never would have discovered if you didn't take on that first challenge. Yeah. I love how BMW i was based off of this idea and it's integrated into the sub-brand, it's integrated into the meaning, it's integrated into the mission. And for me, just listening to you speak, it gives me even more trust in the BMW i brand, knowing this is where it was born, this is where it's going, and this is where we're heading. Guys, get on board. If you're having these comments of negativity, okay, I get it. Change is a little bit difficult for everybody. But hearing the story of how you were part of this beginning of BMW i and how there's so much trust with the team, I, for one, feel reassured knowing that the future looks really great for BMW i with whatever you guys design. So that's Thank you very much. My pleasure. <laughs> my pleasure. And just to give our podcast listeners an idea of where we are in the history of BMW i, what time frame was this? What year? When we really started about these topics that will come up, as I just mentioned, with the uh, um, cities and how they got crowded in the future, this was around about 2007, 8, 9. And then um, I think it was like, two, if, if I remember right, it was like 2009 when, when the um, Project I team got assembled and the budget. And then I think around about 2010, 11, 12, when we developed the, the sub brand and then actually showed up with the i3 and the i8. Amazing. So a little over a decade. A little over, yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's that long already? Doesn't feel like it. <laughs> Crazy, right? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so let's change gears yet again and go back to our rapid fire segment number two and answer as quickly as you can, Kai, in one or two sentences. Are you ready? Okay, I'm ready. Okay, here we go with question number one. What was the inspiration for the IX? Well, that was a monolith. Um, you might remember 2001 Space Odyssey, the movie. Uh -huh. uh, and that precision and uh, beauty of that uh, monolith in the beginning in the context, that was kind of the inspiration on this one. Wow. Kubrick's a master. Totally. Yeah. Makes total sense. Rapid question number two. If the IX would be an animal, what would it be? That's kind of like a really cliche question, but I would like to answer. And uh, yeah, I mean, there, there are many wrongs and rights, but uh, I would say um, I like a gorilla because gorillas also show that vegetarians could be powerful and grateful. Not everybody believes. There you go. There you go. Rapid fire question number three. How do you design a car? How do you start? Pencil, pen, clay, computer? I really like to draw. I start with pens as long as I am allowed to draw. I got a whole team who could do it very well and do have more time. And sometimes they can do it better than me. So I believe on these ones, give the trust to them. Amazing. I like drawing. Amazing. Rapid fire question number four, how long does it take for a final design? Um, I mean, we do a design development officially in the process for around about two years and uh, overall development on the whole car gets up like three to four years, uh, but we're never done in the development. Rapid fire question number five, how long ahead of the release of a new car is the design done? Oh, okay, that's good. I can, <laughs> uh, till the end, because always things happen. So we have to react till the end to the car and we are still uh, looking at every single detail till the end, we're all together. Rapid fire question number six, what's your favorite BMW of all time? Again, kind of cliche thing, um, <laughs> I mean, after all, I'm really a car guy, and I really like the 3.0 CSL. I really like it. There you go. You heard as it As many. First. As many. <laughs> it's a beauty. It sure is. Yeah. Well done, Kai. Thank you so much. So before we wrap up, is there anything you'd like to tell our podcast listeners to see what's maybe on the horizon from BMW i? Okay. We, we had the iX right now. So um, you've seen that one. Um, there will be an i4. You obviously know we showed a concept car already. Um, this one will will show up next. And as much I would like to uh, tell you what kind of ideas we have, I simply can't say that now. 
Oh, the whole interview. I'm trying to get stuff out of you. Good for you. Good for you to stick in for your guns. Well done. That's what makes it even more exciting about BMW i to see what's out there on the future when it does roll out in good time. Thank you, Kai, so much for spending time with us today. I really appreciate it. From exterior designer all the way up to the head of design for BMW i, Kai Lange, geez, man, you put the inspiration into innovation on whatever you touch. Designing for the future, you know, it's not always easy, especially when there is change involved. But at the end of the day, without innovation, there is no growth. And when there's no growth, there's stagnation. And BMW does not stagnate, not for a second. That's why it's so important to understand the reasons behind change. Communicate about those reasons and stay open and, like you said, Kai, curious to what changes can do for us to help us along this journey of sustainable mobility. Kai, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you for your invitation. That was a pleasure. Same Thank you very much. Awesome. And thank you, our podcast listeners, for tuning in to this week's episode of Changing Lanes. We have planned even more episodes on the topic of change, so stay tuned. If you enjoyed this episode, please make sure you subscribe to our podcast for future episodes. And to dive deeper into all things BMW, head on over to BMW.com to learn more. I'm Jonathan, and this has been Changing Lanes. See you next time.